Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming uh, tonight to uh, Sleepless Nights, the science behind better sleep and healthy aging. My name is Chris Walker. I'll be your moderator for this evening. Our guests are here, and I'll introduce them all in just a moment. Uh, this sounds pretty loud. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. So before we begin, um, my name is Chris. I uh, host the CBC Morning Show here in Kelowna for, uh, called Daybreak, and I have a short story, a cautionary tale, if you will, about sleep. Now, you may know that Carlos Santana is playing just around the corner tonight, so after this, if you've got nothing to do, you can head over and see Santana. And that is deeply ironic for me, for reasons that will become clear in just a moment. So I host a morning show, so I wake up at 3.30 every morning uh, to get ready to go to work. And a few years ago, um, not only was I waking up at 3.30 in the morning, but I also had a colicky baby at home. Uh, my marriage was falling apart, and I was addicted to sleeping pills. So I was getting, on a good night, three hours of sleep. Lots of stress, hard work, maybe three hours a night if I was lucky. There were lots of nights where I got no sleep at all. That is not the kind of person you want to put in front of a microphone. It's not the kind of person you want to put on Twitter either. And so what happened? In the middle of all this, after a particularly bad sleepless night, I got a strange news tip. And I got very confused about this news tip. And so I got on Twitter and I announced that Carlos Santana had died. In about 60 seconds, I realized my mistake, but it was too late. Twitter went crazy. The news was reported by the LA Times, by USA Today, and by Hollywood Reporter. Then I got a message from someone named Stella Sant Santana, Carlos Santana's daughter, who said, I just got off the phone with my father and he's very much alive. And then my editor in Vancouver called. And then my editor in Toronto called. Within five minutes, I had issued a correction and an apology, but it was all too late. And of course, Santana was not dead because he's playing just over there tonight. And then my apology got picked up by the LA Times, by USA Today, even by CNN. The moral of the story, make sleep a priority or you might just kill a famous rock star. So with that out of the way, and my confession, now you can see why Santana playing over there on Tonight of All Nights is ironic for me. We spend a third of our lives sleeping, if we're lucky. Sound sleep is one of the three pillars of good health, along with, of course, a balanced diet and regular exercise. And the needs that we have change over a lifetime. Right? Children and teenagers especially need more sleep than adults. People who get a full night's sleep without interruptions have lower rates of high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, and other chronic illnesses. Now, many older adults get less sleep than we need. About a third of older adults report sleeping few hours per night than recommended for optimal physical health and, uh, and mental health. Now, many people believe that poor sleep is just part of aging, but that is not true. Many health or adu healthy adults, in fact, report no sleep problems at all. Sleep patterns do change as we age, but disturbed sleep and waking up tired every day are not part of normal aging. Most sleep disorders, like, for example, being addicted to sleeping pills, as I was, are preventable or treatable, and I'm happy to say that my physician got me off those sleeping pills. Uh, Friday, March 16th, is the 11th Annual World Sleep Day, which is created and hosted by the World Sleep Society. It's internationally uh, recognized to raise awareness of sleep as a human privilege that's often compromised by the habits of modern life. Especially these days, these things. Uh, Insomnia also costs us money as a society. Between, in the U.S., 
93 and 107 billion dollars per year. Uh, 71,000 people suffer injuries every year because of sleep-related accidents. 1,500 people die every year because of sleep-related accidents. Maybe you've been woken up, as I have, by the rumble strips in the middle of the road. Half of people with frequent sleep disturbances report missing work or events, making errors at work, compared to 15% of healthy sleepers. So tonight we're going to hear all kinds of different aspects of healthy sleep. Um, we have uh, our four panelists here. We'll each have a presentation for 10 minutes. We'll take a short break after that for some refreshments. We'll reconvene, and then we'll have all questions from you and questions from me for all of our guests tonight. Uh, we also have evaluation forms on your tables. If you could uh, fill those out before you leave, and we're going to close down at 7 p.m., on the nose so that you can get to Santana or get home and have a good night's sleep. We will be taking a few pictures of tonight. Uh, if you do not want to be included in pictures, which I assume will go on social media and around the web, please let us know just before you leave and we'll make sure to take care of that. With the business out of the way, I'd like to now introduce our uh, panelists. Uh, Dr. Wayne Lai is the medical director of the Kootenai Sleep Center and Northern uh, BC Sleep Center. He's also a clinical assistant professor with the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. Dr. Lai, uh, could you wave so we can see you? Yes, good. Uh, he trained in neurology and sleep medicine at the University Hospital of Cleveland, uh, Western Reserve Univers University in Ohio. Please welcome Dr. Wayne Lai. To my immediate right, Dr. Teresa Lou Ambrose is a professor in the Department of Physical Therapy in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. She's a professor uh, and Canada Research Chair in Physical Activity, Mobility, and Cognitive Health. Her research focuses on healthy aging with a concentration on promoting cognitive and mobility outcomes in older adults with physical activity and exercise. Please welcome Dr. Lou Ambrose. Next to her is Dr. Glenn Foster, an assistant professor at the School of Health and Exercise Sciences uh, here at UBC Okanagan. He's an assistant professor on Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research Scholar with the School of Health and Exercise Sciences. His research focuses on identifying the mechanisms responsible for the associations between cardiovascular disease and sleep disordered breathing with hopes of identifying novel treatments capable of protecting sleep apnea patients from cardiovascular disease. And if you listened to our program this morning, you will have heard uh, Dr. Foster and I in conversation. Please welcome Dr. Glenn Foster. And Dr. Wendy Richardson is a family physician and CPAP user. She immigrated to Summerland 10 years ago where she practices as a GP. She's going to share her personal experiences with sleep apnea and using a CPAP for the past two and a half years. Please welcome Dr. Wendy Richardson. We'll start now back at the beginning with Dr. Wayne Lai, who is going to talk to us for five or 10 minutes. There you are, Dr. Lai. I'll give you this one. Does that work? Is that better now? Is that, can anyone? Okay, great, okay, good. So I have two disclaimer. First, I'm not a, really a host, and I'm not a journalist. So I can't really talk as well as Chris Walker does. Um, secondly, um, as a physician, we are trained to talk to patients one-on-one, -on -one, so it is hard for me to talk to this many people all at one time. So if I start rumbly or start being speaking, speaking too fast, I might be speaking Chinglish, because I speak Chinese and English. And that meant to be a joke, by the way. So I brought some cheat sheets for me to do, because I normally I do it with the PowerPoint. Uh, so if you don't mind, I might be reading off some of my paper here. I'm going to start reading some of the story that may be related, or they are related to sleep deprivations. So in 1979, the most serious nuclear accident on American soil took place at the Three Mile Island Unit 2 reactor near Middleton, Pennsylvania. Sleep deprived shift workers failed to notice the plant lost coolant in the early morning hours of March 28, 1979, 
And by the time the situation was discovered, more than half of the nuclear reactor core has melted. The cleanup took nearly 12 years and it cost nearly $1 billion. On the morning of January 28, 1986, only about 73 seconds after launching, the space shuttle Challenger exploded, killing all seven astronauts aboard. The explosion was triggered by an O-ring seal that fell in one of the boosters, allowing pressurized air to escape. The O-ring has never been tested in a temperature less than 53 Fahrenheit. On that particular day of launch, the temperature was way below that, so the engineer has actually recommended to postpone the launch. However, the NASA manager, who has only slept two hours before arriving at work that morning at 1 a.m., rejected the recommendations. April 26, 1986, in Chernobyl, Ukraine, a sudden surge of power during a system test destroyed a nuclear reactor, causing a fire that released catastrophic amount of radiation, killing many people and evacuated 300,000 around an area. While a flawed reactor design contributed to the meltdown, a human error do trigger the accident. The sleep-deprived engineer, who had been working about 13 and more hours at the plant at a very low power and failed to communicate with the safety personnel. After midnight on March 24, 1989, a 987-foot oil tanker, Axon Valdez, ran aground in Alaska, spilling more than 10 million, tons of, um, 10 million gallons of crude oil into Prince William Sound. In the investigation that followed, it was determined that the crewman piloting the ship has fallen asleep. After control, after working around 18 hours straight before the accident. Moving forward, so on February 25, 2010, at approximately 4.25 a.m., two trains derailed while entering a small town in Quebec. The derailed train down adjacent hydro lines and struck two houses and a garage before coming to a stop. So after some investigation, it was also determined that the crew was not able to make complex issue lightly degraded due to fatigue as well. More recently, um, in, in September two, 2016, a commuter train crashed, killed a woman and injured 100 people in Hoboken, New Jersey, in uh, terminals. More than 400 crews after that was investigated. It was found to have sleep apnea and was put to stop to work until they were treated. So stories like this, they are not a rarity. If one were to do more research, more in-depth research, more other incidents like this that are related to sleep deprivation can be identified. We are all at times the ca uh, uh, casualty caused by lack of sleep. It can be pouring orange juice on a, on a cereal or putting the milk into a cabinet, leaving the key in the front door or forget to turn the stove, etc. While sour milk may be tragic when, when it was found when we came home in a, uh, um, after work, and that's assuming that your house wasn't robbed or wasn't burned down, most of these incidents are relatively innocuous. Unfortunately, starting your day sleep deprived can have far serious consequences. One in six fatal car, uh, car crash are believed to be related to insufficient sleep. So taking sleep deprivation due to sleep apnea alone, a report published by American Academy of Sleep Medicine in 2016, it reported that the annual economic burden of undiagnosed sleep apnea among U.S. adults can be as high as $150 billion. Out of that, $87 billion are lost in productivity, $26 billion are resulted in motor vehicle accidents, and six billion are in workplace accidents. In addition to that, there's also $30 billion increase in the health care utilizations. So the three most common sleep conditions that we see as a clinician are the following. The first common one is sleep apnea. The second one is what's called a limb movement disorder. 
Uh, what that really means is that when, when sometimes when we are sleeping, we have an excessive limb movement. It can be related to the leg or the arm. And this type of limb movement can sometimes result into what we call a cortical arousal, which is a change in the brain wave activity from a deep stage to a lighter stage of the sleep or even awakening, and that can cause the sleep disruptions. Lastly, it would be chronic insomnia, and two common type of insomnia would be what we call a psychophysiological insomnia or in, uh, inadequate sleep hygiene. So in terms of psychophysiological insomnia, uh, usually in people what we call them the warriors. They, not not the, the warrior, but they worry a lot. So they worry about a, anything and everything. So because of their psychological state uh, being a, a super warrior, that prevents them to getting a good consolidated sleep. So their psychological state is affecting their physical state, resulting not able to sleep well and not able to maintain a good quality sleep throughout the night. And in terms of the in inadequate sleep hygiene, it's typically founded in, in young adult, college students who play a lot of video games or party a lot. They, they, just, they just have a chronic um, insufficient sleep time resulting in sleep problems. So, <clears throat> good sleep hygiene um, is very important um, in terms of obtaining a good night's sleep. So what do I mean by good sleep hygiene? They can be looked at and approached at four different angles. One is that we need to able to maintain a good regular um, sleep cycles. In everybody, we have an intrinsic biological clock, what we call a circadian rhythm. That rhythm would dictate when and how long we sleep, and everybody has a different type of biological clock. But if we were to maintain a good fixed sleep cycle, we are allowing our body to let our physical body know when to sleep and when to stay asleep. So that is very important in terms of getting a very fixed sleep cycle, especially in someone who has insomnia. Normally, based on the research, getting six to eight hours of sleep is generally sufficient. There's um, an epidemiology study that was done a few years ago looking at how many hours of sleep is good sleep. Um, so the, the, the study is actually quite interesting. Um, if, if, they, if they would look someone who's a short, sleepy, short sleeper, less than six hours of sleep, versus someone who's a long sleeper, more than nine to 10 hours of sleep, they tend to find that this, patient, this, this population base of patients tend to have higher mortality. So based on that study, we currently recommending patients to obtain sleep between six to eight. However, having said that, and now we don't look at that number and apply it to everyone. Uh, we also treat patients individually. So if someone has been sleeping five hours a day and they are feeling great, we don't really push them to sleep longer, but in general, six to eight or nine hours is a good sleep time. Secondly, that in order to get a good, uh, to get a good night's sleep, we need to minimize stimulation prior to bed. With the invention of handheld device, you know what I'm talking about, uh, with the iPhone, the Android, the iPad, and all this handheld device, it's creating an uh, iPhone syndrome. Um, so a lot of those devices has blue spectrum light, and the blue spectrum light is notorious in, in inhibiting the release of melatonin, which is essential to induce sleep and prepare your body to go into that sleep stage. Uh, so by looking at the phone right before you go to bed, it will prevent that, and normally that effect will last up to about two to three hours. Large meal or heavy exercise is usually not encouraged as well, uh, because as you know, we, we eat meal to supply energy to our body. So anything that we eat will get converted to glucose, and those are fuel uh, to, to, to allow our body to function. So by eating a very large, large meal before you go to bed would actually keep that functioning, that, that glucose, uh, that fuel going, so it does prevent we getting into that resting sleep. Heavy exercise would also overall increase your sympathetic activity as well, allowing not to relax and go to sleep. Caffeine is also another big thing, and caffeine can be from coffee, 
energy drink, uh, from pop, or uh, from tea. And surprisingly, most people do not know that caffeine has a half-life of up to six hours. That means that if you drink 100 grams of caffeine, six hours later, there's still about 50 grams of caffeine. So normally, for anything to be clear from our body, completely, it takes about three half-life cycle. So for the caffeine to be complete out of the system, it takes about 15 hours or longer. So normally, we don't recommend patients to drink any caffeinated beverage after 12 p.m. because if you drink too late, it does intrude into your sleep cycle. Alcohol is good. Some people like it. They don't, when they have hard time sleep, they will drink alcohol. It does make them sleep fall asleep faster, but we do know that alcohol causes fragmentation of the sleep on the second half of the sleep. So even though they can fall asleep faster, um, the second half of the night, they, they just don't sleep well at all. The third point is that the sleep area um, need to be a little bit more conducive. Uh, what I mean by that is that you need to make the sleep area a little bit more comfortable, you know, the, the right lighting, the right temperature, uh, the bedding, um, anything that you need to make you comfortable. So when we have patients come into our lab for study, I usually ask them to bring anything that they need to to make them comfortable, including a teddy bear or uh, your own pillow or anything just to make you comfortable. So, so, so at home, we should do all the same as well. And lastly, um, and this is something that most people do not do, is we should actively engage in relaxation trying to sleep as well. Um, nowadays, we're so busy, uh, our adrenaline is pumping all the time. We work until we go to bed. So most of us do not have enough time or it does not allow our body to have that enough time to relax and prepare ourselves to go to sleep. Um, there are many things that we can do, uh, like yoga, uh, listen to soothing music. Sometimes I ask patients to new to read newspaper, uh, that's relaxing as well, as opposed to watching something very violent on TV. Um, I have a friend who actually developed a website called www.rennymood.com. So rainrennymood.com. So he developed this website for his son uh, when he was younger and having trouble falling asleep. And he's a musician and an IT guy. So somehow he, he found that rainy sound combined with the music is relaxing for his son to fall to sleep. So he's not composing um, a segment of music, and now he's posting on a website, and they are free. Uh, so yeah, you're welcome to utilize that. It's www.rennymood.com. And, and thirdly, in my, clinic, uh, my, my clinical practice, I do get asked quite a bit about how about taking a, a, a natural supplement um, a lot of people like to take natural supplements as opposed to taking sleeping medications. Uh, there are quite a few uh, natural supplements that have good scientific research on it and they're quite effective, such as melatonin, taking magnesium can be helpful, B6, tryptophan, valerian, GABA-like aging, and also um, chamomile tea can also be calming as well. And I'll be happy to go into a little bit more of that later when we get into Q&A. Um, lastly, I think I've run over 10 minutes already. <laughs> so, so, so lastly, I, I do want to stress that there are people in the community that are also expert in managing sleep as well. Uh, one of my co-worker, Alina Kruzak, she has started a company called Community Sleep Coach, and she's based here in Kelowna, and she is a certified clinical sleep educator, so they do also help patients who had trouble getting a good night's sleep to obtain a good sleep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lai. Dr. Lou Ambrose. Great. Um, thank you, and good evening, everybody. Um, and you can all ignore the cup of coffee I have behind my uh, chair here. <laughs> it's obviously after 12 p.m., but um, here we go. So um, I guess first to start off with, um, unlike most of the other panelists here, um, my background did not originate in sleep. So I am a researcher. I focus um, primarily on aging and, and really on uh, brain aging. Um, and over the last 10 years, if you really are focusing on how to um, age well in terms of your brain, you can't ignore sleep. Just as the evidence is just accumulating to indicate that um, 
good sleep is really necessary for uh, cognitive health. And so we've already heard about these pretty um, dire consequences of poor sleep when it comes to decision making, <laughs> et cetera. But we also know um, across different studies now where we basically assess and measure people's cognitive performance that even after one night of poor sleep, there is very obvious and measurable uh, reduction in one's um, cognitive abilities. And some of you may think, well, that's okay, I'll just get a good night's sleep the next day. But what we do you know is, is that as you age, we typically do see changes in uh, sleep patterns, and not necessarily something so extreme such as insomnia or having um, sleep apnea, but simply even just a shorter duration of sleep, and that's a really common complaint among older adults. And we do know that when you have shorter sleep durations, typically six, or, six hours or less on a chronic basis, that's actually increased uh, risk for, uh, for developing cognitive impairment and dementia. So it's not just about making, um, having an impact on your decision making for that one day, but it actually can increase your risk of developing dementia as you age. And that's why it's so critical for those of us who do study uh, brain health that sleep becomes a critical component of what we do. Um, so in the most recent um, meta-analysis, so a meta-analysis is basically a, a systematic approach where we review all the evidence to look at what is all the different papers consistently say. And in, in essence, what, what the evidence does suggest is that if you are sleeping six hours or less or having longer durations of sleep, such as 10 hours or more, among older adults, you are um, at greater risk for developing cognitive issues. And so. There's a lot of um, research now trying to better understand what is that association. So first and foremost, there's been some fascinating uh, evidence to suggest that when you sleep, what happens is you're literally washing the waste from your brain. So it's not just about getting a good night's sleep to get restful sleep for your physical body, but your brain actually washes itself out and cleans itself out. And specifically, the evidence shows that it's actually washing out what we call beta amyloid. So amyloid is a waste product that when it accumulates is typically what we associate with Alzheimer's disease or pathology. So with sleep, when you sleep well, you actually wash it out on a nightly basis. So as you can imagine, if you are chronically not sleeping well, you get an accumulation. But the relationship is a little bit more complex because it could also be bidirectional, meaning that we also think that it's possible that people start not sleeping well as they age because they have early Alzheimer's disease, meaning that somehow their brain is accumulating the amyloid and that's actually causing them to now sleep shorter durations. So the relationship is complex, but there certainly is some type of relationship between how well you're sleeping as you age and how much you're trying to protect it um, and its association with your risk of developing cognitive issues. Um, so, now, there is a lot of research as to how we can improve sleep in older adults. Again, not so much specifically within the context of sleep apnea um, or people who have chronic insomnia, but more just these kind of um, more fragmented sleep, shorter durations of sleep. And what we're typically targeting is actually back to the biological clock, the circadian rhythm piece. So with circadian rhythm, um, again, it's sort of how your body regulates itself, not just the sleep piece, but your appetite, your heat regulation, that all goes back to that whole circadian rhythm piece. Um, we do know that as you age, your biological clock becomes a little bit less sensitive to the stimuli that it typically responds to. So our clock responds to a number of things. Uh, eating um, kind of sets its clock, uh, light, is a big, big, what we call a time giver to the clock. So if, when we're talking about your biological clock, if you ever go camping, I don't know if you, um, I'll, you know, notice this, but you tend to sleep a little bit earlier, probably around nine, and you wake up earlier, right? All without an alarm clock. Because what, we, what your body's doing is syncing with the natural, you know, sunrise and sunset. And that's a natural rhythm that we typically are, would be operating in if we didn't have all this artificial light and you know iPads, et cetera. Um, and so that means your body in itself can set the clock. And what we know with you age is that your, the clock in itself can be less sensitive to the stimuli or become more impaired because of perhaps some neurodegenerative issues that's occurring within the brain. So the strategy 
or the thought is right now is how can we kind of boost it so give it artificial or increase the time giver so that's where things such as bright light therapy is coming into play so um, so not just about removing light at nighttime but perhaps giving light when we should be giving be having light so earlier in the day whether it's purposely exposing yourself to natural light or exposing yourself to artificial blue light um, and trying to set that rhythm a little bit better so that you can actually regain a better sleep pattern naturally without medication or et cetera. The other um, time giver that we're exploring a lot is actually exercise, in part because um, there is also literature to suggest that physical activity itself can also be a stimulant to the biological clock. Again, timing is critical, so I also agree that you wouldn't probably want to exercise late at night, but again, midday and perhaps mid-afternoon would be the most appropriate time to set that clock or to regulate your clock so that you can naturally set that rhythm. And so that's sort of the approach that's, um, that's been that is currently being investigated among older adults with some cognitive issues. So not with established sleep disorders, but we know that their pattern of sleep is disrupted. They're demonstrating some cognitive issues and we're trying to regulate their sleep as a way of trying to protect them from further decline. Because again, there's a bi-directional relationship between um, you know, the, the manifestation of cognitive impairment and sleep, dis um, sleep disruptions uh, with age. I think I'll stop at that. Thank you, Dr. Lou Ambrose. Dr. Foster, Dr. Glenn Foster. Great, uh, thank you, and I'd just like to thank everyone for attending this evening. It's great to see such a, a full house and, and uh, some uh, keen ears out there listening to all the exciting things we have to say. Uh, I'm going to kind of move the conversation a little bit towards a, a specific condition that can affect sleep quality, uh, which is sleep disordered breathing. And one of the major uh, forms of sleep disordered breathing is called obstructive sleep apnea. In the interest of, of not having to say obstructive sleep apnea all night, we're going to short form that down to simply OSA. Now, sleep disordered breathing, or OSA, uh, can affect sleep quality, it can affect cognition, and it can also affect your cardiovascular health. And one of the uh, uh, approaches that I've been trying to take in, in, in my research is trying to identify why is it that sleep disordered breathing, or OSA, leads to cardiovascular disease, and, and can we find a way to, to treat it? Um, so who's affected by OSA? Well, greater than 15% of the middle-aged population is believed to be suffering from OSA. Uh, it's highly prevalent in those who are obese, about 80% prevalent. And it's also highly pre prevalent in high-risk patient populations, such as those suffering from kidney disease, stroke, and heart failure. So what exactly is OSA? Well, essentially, it's a breathing disorder. So you stop breathing when you're asleep. You don't stop breathing for very long, of course, because that would be a problem. But you do stop breathing for about 20 seconds on average. And this can happen hundreds of times during a night of sleep. Now, from a physiological perspective, that has implications, of course, right? When you stop breathing, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lungs becomes impaired. And, and this obviously is occurring repeatedly throughout a night of sleep, and so this is causing what we call intermittent hypoxia. So let's really put this into perspective as far as what intermittent hypoxia is. Well, it's like traveling to the peak of Mount Everest in a 20-second period, hundreds of times throughout a night of sleep. Now obviously that has a pretty major impact and stress on our body. I'm gonna talk about two different aspects of that, and the first aspect kind of relates to sleep quality, and so it's really about why does sleep disordered breathing lead to sleep fragmentation. Now much like Chris, I wake up at 3.30 in the morning every day, but not because I want to, because my four-year-old daughter comes into my room to wake me up just because she wants a hug. Now that leads to some serious sleep fragmentation. Now of course I love it, but that, that aside, I can you know, firsthand speak to the cognitive deficits that that sleep fragmentation has caused. So, why does sleep apnea cause sleep fragmentation? Well, when you stop breathing, the oxygen levels in your blood change, the CO2 levels in your blood change, and this stimulates organs in your neck called the carotid body. That senses back to the brain and causes your brain to eventually micro-awaken, 
And we call these arousals, and, and uh, Dr. Lai mentioned this earlier. These micro-awakenings, you don't really realize they're occurring the next morning. You, you'll, you'll wake up and you'll think that you slept all night, even though you were waking up hundreds of times for a fraction of a second, or a few seconds, I should say. So this sleep fragmentation, or this, th these micro-awakenings that, that take place, are actually really important, because they're thought to be what allows you to start breathing again. So in obstructive sleep apnea, what happens is there's a loss of muscle tone in the airway. And your airway collapses when you're breathing, and that obviously makes it hard to breathe. It obstructs the airway. And in order to re regain that tone in those airway muscles, that microarousal is critical in kind of sending those signals to the muscles to dilate the airway back open and allow you to move the air again. So sleep fragmentation happens with sleep apnea. Um, and of course, it causes you to lose the restorative deep sleep that we so deeply uh, want to uh, obtain. As a result, OSA patients report symptoms of daytime sleepiness and fatigue, uh, and it's also associated with impairments in cognition. And as we heard from Dr. Lai, it can lead to some serious workplace and motor vehicle accidents that uh, can be deadly. Now, there is a treatment for sleep apnea that works quite well for sleep fragmentation. And that's called CPAP. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about that from our last speaker tonight. But I'll give a little bit of a sense as to what CPAP does. Now, I'm gonna explain CPAP to you in, in very simple terms. Put a nice comfortable mask over your nose or, or maybe your nose and your mouth. There's a small tube that comes off of that and then connect it to a leaf blower. That's pretty much what CPAP is. So we're blowing air into a mask to generate pressure that splints the airway open and that allows you to continue to breathe normally as you should. Uh, it also removes the intermittent hypoxia, which we'll discuss a, a little bit later on. So CPAP is quite effective in improving sleep quality and it does so, as I said, by splinting the airway open. And there's many CPAP users that just love to use their CPAP machine because it makes them sleep so much better and feel better during the day. Now, despite that success, there are some really damning statistics for CPAP. It's often considered uncomfortable, uh, and that is probably one of many reasons why 30 to 50% of patients are non-compliant with, with therapy or abandon therapy altogether. So that's a big concern for us, and that likely accounts for the failure of CPAP to reduce the cardiovascular risk that, is, uh, that has been uh, observed um, or sorry, the, yeah, the failure of CPAP to reduce cardiovascular risk that's been observed in some large-scale epidemiological studies. So that brings me to the second topic that I want to focus on, which is more related to my research, which has, has to do with the relationship between OSA and the risk for cardiovascular disease. And it's believed that intermittent hypoxia is associated with, uh, that's associated with, with OSA is responsible for the association uh, with OSA and cardiovascular disease, uh, and specifically hypertension, heart attack, and stroke. And unfortunately, CPAP doesn't appear to offer any protection uh, against this, and that's obviously very concerning to us. Now, we think that uh, that's probably due to a lack of compliance, which means that CPAP users aren't using their CPAP enough. And if we look at some of the epidemiological studies, we can see that on average, CPAP users only use their device for less than four hours a night. I don't know about you, but I prefer to get eight hours a night. And so if you're only using CPAP for half the night, then the OSA returns and the exposure to intermittent hypoxia returns, and that has, vascular, uh, has implications on vascular function. So obviously it's very important to improve compliance among our CPAP users. And obviously I think that's something that uh, those who are directly working with OSA patients uh, should strive to do. Uh, but as an alternative, perhaps we can try and find a different treatment or maybe an, an adjunctive treatment that works alongside CPAP to help protect these patients from, in, from uh, cardiovascular disease. And that's specifically what my research tries to do. We're trying to identify mechanisms whereby um, intermittent hypoxia affects the cardiovascular and respiratory system. And in doing so, we hope that we can find a target that uh, will prevent that association and prevent the cardiovascular disease that's associated with OSA. Now, my approach to this has been trying to translate animal research to the human. And there's been some elegant studies that were done about 10 to 15 years ago 
that shows that when we take animals and expose them to intermittent hypoxia, they become hypertensive. And if we interfere with the chemo reflex loop, we can prevent that hypertension from occurring in response to intermittent hypoxia. So what's the chemo reflex? Well, I sort of described it earlier, and it has to do with these two organs in, in either side of your neck. And these two organs are very small, and they, they essentially taste the blood as it goes to your brain. It detects the oxygen and CO2 uh, in the blood. In response to changes in, in, uh, in the blood gases, the chemo reflex is going to either increase or decrease your breathing, and it's going to increase sympathetic nervous system activity to either increase your heart rate or your blood pressure. So the chemo reflex obviously has, is, a, is a very, very integrated uh, into the, the body's physiological systems, uh, and it's very important in terms of respiratory and cardiovascular control. So in these animal studies, they were able to interfere with this chemo reflex loop and prevent uh, the blood pressure response to intermittent hypoxia, and we've been able to try and show, essentially show the same thing in healthy humans. So we've simulated intermittent hypoxia in healthy humans, and when we expose them to that, we can cause their blood pressure increase, and we can cause it to increase for a long period of time. And if we pretreat them with a pharmacological agent, we're able to prevent that increase in blood pressure. Now, essentially what's happening when, we expo when we're exposed to intermittent hypoxia is those organs in our neck called the carotid body, uh, there's a hormone system within them that gets activated, and that causes the sensitivity of the carotid body to be increased. When you increase the sensitivity of the carotid body, it means that for a given stimulus, there's going to be a larger response, so a greater ventilatory response perhaps, or a greater sympathetic nervous system response. And that's what we observe in OSA patients. So if I was able to record uh, the sympathetic activity in an OSA patient, we would find that their activity is much higher than somebody who doesn't have sleep apnea. And it's believed that this has to do with the chemo reflex loop. So essentially this is a form of neurogenic hypertension. So there's a clear link between carotid body activation and vascular dysfunction, and we can treat this by blocking the actions of this hormone system within the carotid body. Now, of course, there's still many unanswered questions, and we're hoping to address these in, in future studies uh, involving actual patients with sleep apnea to try and identify whether or not we can uh, have a successful uh, effect on cardiovascular disease in OSA patients. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Foster. And then, uh, last but not least, Dr. Wendy Richardson. Well, hi. I'm going to stand up because I tend to wave my arms around. So um, I'm the patient in the talk, but I'm also a, a doctor, but I've come here as a doctor. Um, no. Continue, Dr. Richardson. You oh. need to uh, hold the microphone up closer to your oh, mouth. it needs please. to be a bit closer. Okay. Um, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea two and a half years ago, but my path to being diagnosed was not the traditional one. Um, most people who have sleep disordered breathing, obstructive sleep apnea, and this is really doing typecast things, they tend to be male. There aren't so many women, so they tend to be male. They tend to be very overweight, which I'm a bit overweight, but they tend to be very overweight. They tend to have big necks, um, and that's partly because when the muscles go loose, then your neck collapses and that obstructs your breathing. So I am not male, I don't have a big neck, and also other factors are hypertension, don't have that, diabetes, don't have that. But what I presented with, and I didn't diagnose myself at all, oh, and snoring, sorry, I forgot snoring. Very loud snoring, if anybody says, oh, my husband snores like crazy, they need to be checked out. Okay. Um, I apparently burble, according to my daughter, so it doesn't wake her up when we go on holiday, or didn't used to. So I presented because my memory had gone, or a bit of my memory had gone, which, as I live by my memory, or I work by my memory, was really quite worrying. So what was happening to me was that I'd see somebody one day and I'd see them the next day, and I couldn't remember what had gone on the day before. 
Luckily, I had notes, so I could remind myself. I'd meet new people, and I'd see them again the next day, and I didn't recognize them. And so, being a doctor, I thought I had a brain tumor. So I presented to a neurologist, and he listened to my story and said, I think you've got sleep apnea. I was like, really? So that was how it started. The other thing which I didn't fit in with it, and in fact we haven't mentioned yet, is headache. I had been having daily headaches for months, probably even years, which I just thought were migraines and I was very out of luck. If I drank some alcohol, they were even worse the next day and so bad that I couldn't even swallow painkillers. I felt so sick. But I still carried on working because that's what doctors do. Um, we're also used to being sleep deprived because that's how our, our training goes. It used to anyway. So we're used to being sleep deprived and carry on working. But I had a headache and my memory had gone. And that was, well, my short term memory, my long term memory. I remembered people I'd known for a long time, but somebody I'd met the day before, I wouldn't recognize the next day. And that really wasn't good. So, um, I can't quite remember what my figures were. I meant to ask Dr. Lai to remind me, but I, I think I can sort of remember. I think I was getting around 20 episodes an hour where I was stopping breathing. So basically, every three minutes, I was having these little micro awakenings and then going back to sleep again, and then three minutes later. So that is an awful lot of awakenings and very lousy sleep. The other thing was that my headaches were absolutely dreadful. So once I got the CPAP machine, my headaches went, which was fantastic. I could drink a glass of wine without suffering the following day, which was even better. Um, and my memory slowly came back, didn't come back instantly. Um, probably took a month or two for my brain to be fully firing on all cylinders. Now, I recently asked the neurologist what exactly was happening for that. And he's a very clever guy in Penticton, Dr. Davidson. Um, and he, his explanation was that your brain consolidates the day's memory when you sleep. And if you're not getting decent sleep, then your brain loses the memory. And that was what he thought was happening to me. And the low oxygen was giving me the stinky. So I am the sort of poster girl for my CPAP machine because I actually sleep now nine and a half hours a night because it tells you. Um, and I just, my brain's working, my headaches have gone, hurrah. Um, now, sometimes, as I say, snoring, of my patients, I've got a few on CPAP and I really encourage them to continue using it. One lady came to me because she'd gone on holiday with her friends and she, would, she had to go and sleep on the balcony of the hotel because her snoring was keeping them all awake. So that's not good. Um, another gentleman who's very slender would wake up choking. And so he got tested. He's now got a CPAP machine. But there are some people who don't believe it's doing them any good. And I know it's doing them good because I just won't sleep without it. We actually had a scheduled power outage in Summerland, which they decided to do in the middle of the night for eight hours. Um, and I thought I would tough it out. I felt dreadful the next day. And then the second time that they did it, I went and stayed somewhere where they actually had power and I'm thinking of getting a generator. Um, so I'm certainly, it's been absolutely wonderful for me. Um, you might feel it's not very sexy to go to sleep with a mask on, on your face and a, and a tube, you know, but uh, all right, that's me for the moment. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. So I've already learned a lot uh, and I have a lot of questions. The, the, Biggest thing I learned was I'm very glad I'm not a nuclear engineer or the captain of an oil tanker. <laughs> um, how many of you 
slept well last night? Hands up. Okay, about half. How many of you have sleep problems generally? A lot more than half. So think about why you might have those sleep problems and keep that question in your mind for 15 minutes as we have a quick break and then come back and ask it. Okay? There are refreshments at the back. Someone wrote it down for us, and uh, if you could put your, if you have a question, put your hand up, and uh, we'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, and while we're doing that, the first question is, what's the value of a sleep tracking device like a Fitbit? Are they at all accurate? Help? How can they help improve uh, your sleep? Anybody want to tackle that one, Doctor Lai? I suppose you need a microphone for that. There you go. How many people oh. use uh, Fitbits or sleep trackers? Yeah, I sometimes do. I don't trust it. Hello? <laughs> Is it on right now? It's on. Is it on? Yeah. So I presume that you are talking about a Fitbit and some of those wearable device to track your sleep. So apparently there's a lot of research being done already in that, in that regard. And, and the conclusion is not surprising is that it's not very accurate at all. So what, what, what those companies are trying to do is that they are actually detecting motions. Um, the only way anyone can truly accurately say that you are sleeping or not is to by looking at your brain activity. So that requires something called EEG, which is um, encephalogram, step that put on your head and record your brain activity. So without that, we can't really tell whether someone is asleep or not. So those devices, they, they use motion detector. So they are making the assumption that if you don't move, you are asleep. And so that's what those histograms, those, those things that shows at the, at, at the end of the day. So if you are not moving, they are assuming that you are asleep. If you are moving, they are assuming that you are not asleep. You know, having said that, there are newer technology that was just recently published. They are now able to use other surrogate measuring your blood pressure, measuring your pulse, and use that surrogate to, to somehow extract the EEG. Um, so so there are, there are ways that they can actually um, detect, look at your EEG pattern by take, uh, monitoring some of the surrogate. But that's sort of new technology. I don't think they have validated it yet. So most of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the device currently on the market are not very accurate. And I, I do have patients that bring, you know, 30 days of data to my office woman to review them, but I look at that and I do, I respect that, but it, it, you know, the, the data really validating that's not very accurate at all. It's like the sleep equivalent of Googling something, right? Uh, thank you, Dr. Lai. Any, uh, we have a question here. We caught her with her mouth full. <laughs> Go ahead. Excuse me. Um, I have two short questions. Number one is I didn't understand if you, um, Dr. Lee, said much about the TV prior to bed. Some of us have very good friends we live with, and we differ on that, on opinions of that. So I'd like to hear more about how a TV is. And secondly, I was really surprised. I'm 70 and proud of it. And um, I uh, didn't hear anything about what does she call it? Overactive bladder. Like, frankly, I, I'm up two or three times at night, and that's the sleep disturbance thing I have. And I don't want to have to 
you know, some people wear a CPAP. I don't want to wear a catheter to bed. So. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, two good questions there. Who would like to tackle the, the first one about the television? So going, going back to the TV, um, so I do have a patient who told me that, Doc, I just cannot sleep without getting the TV on. It, and I told him that if you are leaving the TV on to have a background sound or music, that's okay. Uh, but having, comparing a TV which you watch from a distance versus watching something from, from a very close up, suddenly having an iPad or iPhone, those blue spectrum effect would be stronger than watching TV you know, four or five feet away. So uh, for those patients who really need to play background music or background sound to fall asleep, I don't, I don't mind having them having TV on. Um, even watch from a long distance. Some, sometimes it's a habit. Some people just need to have that to, to um, sometimes that's what we call a secondary conditioning. Uh, meaning that some people require some sort of stimuli, uh, maybe a TV, a glass of milk, uh, background music. They need that stimuli to condition their body to fall asleep, which is fine for, for some patients. But for people who had trouble falling asleep because of they are just watching too much iPad, those blue spectrum light definitely affect your sleep cycle. Yeah, usually those effect last about two to three hours. Maybe Dr. Liu and Bruce can. Could you pass the, the mic down? Um, sure. Um, although <clears throat> I, get, I get the sense this might be kind of uh, a close friend <laughs> issue. <laughs> um, that aside, I, I would say, you know, in general, that's not recommended um, just because it can be viewed as a stimulus and TV in itself is a source of light. Is it as, you know, strong of some of the, the blue lights? Probably not depending on the distance, but I think even just the content in itself can stimulate, um, can stimulate you, like both your brain, et cetera. So we can potentially have a negative impact on how quickly and how well you'll sleep. Um, but obviously, um, compromises need to be made. <laughs> um, but perhaps if I can, sorry. Well, I have a follow-up question, yeah. if I can, uh, because we're talking about the blue spectrum. Yeah. Your phones have a little um, a red shift button where you can change the night. light on your phone. Is that useful? Um, well, most, I, I, I know the iPhones now have a night setting. So if you select it um, by a certain time, it actually goes into that mode. So it's a dimmer, less, um, you know, bright light. It's less blue, it's more red. Yeah. yeah. But I think aside from light, I think it's just also the cognitive stimulation. So I think, you know, we need to also recognize that it's not just a physical, I mean, I did talk about light being a very strong stimulant and certainly is, uh, but, you know, cognitive stimulants, you know, worrying about something, thinking about something can also be quite, um, a barrier, posing a barrier to, to sleeping. Um, so I think, you know, if you could. Yeah. So. Um, I, in terms of that light source, I don't think it's so strong that it in itself can provide what I was talking about to stimulate to your biological clock, but watching TV, you're thinking about it, you're engaged, so you're actively engaged. That in itself, can be a stimulant, I think is what we're all trying to say. Um, so typically in sleep hygiene courses, they talk about creating a very calm, non-stimulant, you know, relaxing environment to sort of set yourself into a habit. And perhaps that kind of alludes to people's habit of having something in the background. It's almost like a white noise. It's not something you're actively engaged in, but something kind of soothes you. So whether it's music or just background noise, but you're not actively engaged with that stimulant in itself. Uh, your second question was about overactive bladder, and I, that's the, not the first I've heard of that tonight. Uh, now, there's maybe not, oh, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I don't know what you can do about that problem, but about waking up multiple times during the night for other reasons. Are there ways to fall back asleep more effectively? Are there ways to prevent that? Can, can one of you address uh, that one? Um, I can't, but I think I just want to acknowledge that other issues is actually prostate enlargement and also even um, menopause transition. We hear this a lot. It's a challenge. I recognize that I, I, I personally don't have any um, good solutions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I, I when in like doubt, pass the mic. Yeah. Th thank you for that, Lian and Bros, and, and that uh, comment. I just want to add that even though the blue spectrum light is a strong stimulant in inhibiting the, the melatonin, people that they're watching their iPad, iPhone right before they go to bed and they can fall asleep, bang, just like that. There's, but it does not affect everyone equally. So there will be people who does not, is not affected by blue, spe blue spectrum light at all. Uh, but particularly for a patient who is insomniac, people have a hard time falling asleep. Taking away low stimulants would do a lot of good for those people because I, I, I've treated a lot of patients um, with insomnia and if you take those devices away, which is really hard, if you take them away for two or three hours, they start sleeping better and they will come back and tell me that I never realized that just simply by, by not watching my iPad or iPhone, it make my sleep a lot better. Uh, so so I, I guess the point is that there, there are people who are exposed to blue spectrum light and that does not affect them at all. Like my kid, they will watch their phone up until they go to sleep. And when they fall asleep, they, they, when they go to bed, they, they fall asleep right away. Um, and, and second thing regarding that overactive bladder, uh, which is a lot of people who have nocturnal urination, they have to go to bathroom two or three times, um, even more a night. Um, I, one of the gentlemen just asked me the same question about prostate. So those patients, we, we, we class them, classify them as insomnia due to secondary medical issue. So the insomnia are caused by other medical problems. So we need to address that medical issue. Uh, so for someone who has overactive bladder or prostate issue, um, there are medication can either shrink down the prostate, make the passage a bit better, or there are medication can relax the bladder, allow the bladder to be to be filled up more before they have to empty the bladder. So there are medication that can address that. But you know, having said that, a lot of the overactive bladder is actually exacerbated by having a very uh, type one personality. Like if you just worry a lot of things and you just think about things all the time, you, you do tend to have a little bit more overactive bladder. So having a, engaging in an active relaxation before going to bed would also help as well. We also advise patients to reduce their water intake after dinner time, because that will reduce your overall volume of your blood, and so you don't you don't urinate as much for that reason. So by reducing your water intake before you go to bed, will also reduce your nighttime urination as well. And that's the fact of the of the night. Type A personality makes you go pee. <laughs> uh, where's the next question? Hi. Uh, right there. Um, I live in Kelowna. And my doctor has me on the wait list for the sleep clinic, but I've been on that for quite a while, and still I don't fall asleep easily, I don't stay asleep easily. Um, occasionally, I can sleep a long period of time. Are you saying that like 10 hours and more is bad to sleep? And I have a second question after that, sorry. Um. I think it depends. Um, so I'm not saying can't. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so it sounds like when you say 10 hours, that's when you have a good night's sleep. That's yes. when you, yeah. No, I was more talking about if you consistently need 10 hours of sleep. Oh. That's been a, so that's typically deemed as, you know, an extremely longer size. So the window typically, again, is seven to eight or six to eight, depending on what source you're looking at. So I'm referring to chronic, longer durations right. of sleep. Yeah. I think all of us go through periods where we're not sleeping well for various reasons, and we have you know a couple nights of recovery sleep where we sleep longer. That in itself is not associated with um, at least with what I study in terms of the cognitive piece, we're looking for chronic exposures or patterns of longer or shorter durations of sleep. Thank you. Um, my second question is, um, since I'm waiting so long to go to the sleep clinic, I actually do live part-time in the Kootenays. How, um, Dr. Wayne Lee, um, is it possible for us to go to your clinic? <laughs> Dr. Lai, over to you. Sorry. 
Oh, I'm a bit surprised to hear that you waited for how long? Several months. Several um, months. I am, after this, I am going to check with my doctor again and see if she actually did put me on the wait list, but I did ask to go on because of my sleep problems. Oh, it's okay. I, I, my, my reception is actually at the back there. I don't think I'll wait time is more than a few months, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so we, we do triage patients accordingly um, to a provincial set guidelines. Uh, so there are people who need to be seen a little more urgently based on the guideline. We do have to see them more urgently. Um, so depending on your you know, urgency based on the provincially set guideline, they are triaged accordingly. But I don't think our wait time is, 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 is not, it's not lo it's that long. I think it's about two or three months you said, Heather? I see, five, five months. Okay, so, we, so it does vary then. Yeah, we, are so, we are trying the best we can um, because we need to get sleep as well. <laughs> <laughs> Clever. Uh, where's our next question? Right there at the back, go ahead. Uh, thank you, I really appreciate a lot of the comments you have been making, that what, things we should or should not do before going to sleep. Um, unfortunately, my husband had to leave. It's, he's the one that has a sleep apnea machine and hates it. Wakes up, after, he tried it a few times, and when you wake up in the middle of the night, and it's all these cords and all this stuff, and he couldn't figure out how to put it back on, and forget it. And the answer is to keep on trying. He hates it, and that's a very expensive machine. There has to be another way for people that feel claustrophobic with this thing on your face. Seriously. And just telling us, oh, you should get used to it and just do it, that doesn't seem to work. So he's asked me <laughs> to ask you, because he had to leave, <laughs> what should I be watching? And I mean, sometimes he snores really loud, and other times it's just a small purr, and he's okay. But he went to the sleep clinic and definitely was waking up many times during the night. We went back, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, and said, look, it's not working, not doing it, but there wasn't any solutions. Dr. So Richards? We're stuck with a very expensive machine he's not using. Oh. Um, there are certainly different ways that you can actually get the positive, because CPAP, we haven't actually mentioned what it stands for is continuous positive airways pressure. So you've, like the leaf blower, constantly blowing to keep the passages open. Um, there are many different ways that you can actually use it. If he's claustrophobic, some people use like nasal things, nasal prongs, not, not prongs, but like little nasal cushions, pillows, there we go, nice name, um, that actually go into the nostrils. And that can help for claustrophobic people. Um, I'm not a mouth breather, so I just have a nose mask. And actually, I don't like the full face mask because I find that claustrophobic. But the nose mask I'm fine with because I can have mouth. So there are different types of things. Um, I don't know who, who your supplier is of the CPAP, but they have all sorts of different masks that they could try. Um, Oh, I was thinking something. Brain's gone. There's, there's $10 million in it for somebody if they can invent a more comfortable CPAP machine. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I know what I was going to ask. Does he have a beard? No, because often men with beards have a lot more trouble with the CPAP because they have to have it much tighter just to try and get an air seal. But it sounds if he's very claustrophobic, he may be better with the nasal pillows or a nose mask. That does work quite nicely. Uh, next question. I just have a comment. Um, I'm yeah, sorry. go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Okay. Lai, go ahead. They also sell the pink mask as well. That might help. That, that meant to be a joke. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, you know, when we see patients who present into our clinic with a different issue with the mask and that type of thing, we, we tend to troubleshoot for those patients, and it can be, a, like Dr. Richardson was saying that, it can be a, 
the mask issue, it can be a, a pressure issue, um, and then if after we try everything and they still hate it, then we would prescribe them the pink mask. That's still a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is that there is different way that we can help uh, patients to get comfortable with the mask. Even sometimes I prescribe medications just so that they, so we, I can sedate them for a week, two months while they're getting accustomed to the mask. Even if that really fail, then we go to the secondary, the alternative therapy, uh, which would including, you know, the dental appliances and other device that, that has been shown to be effective in treating patients for mild, mild, moderate, not typically for severe sleep apnea, but that can be used if, if they, they couldn't try CPAP, despite anything that we tried, they just couldn't do it, then we would use those um, alternative treatment options. Dr. Richardson, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to add something that I forgot to mention before, is that if your partner snores, then you get a much better night's sleep if he, he or she uses the CPAP machine. So quite, quite often you've also, I've, I've got more male patients than female. Um, and their, their wives are absolutely, their husband doesn't. Uh, next question there. Yeah, thank you for a very informative uh, session to the, all the panelists. Uh, two questions. The first question is, uh, can you comment on the use of the uh, dental appliances uh, for, for people that maybe have a constricted airway and how effective that is? So two questions you said, this is the first uh, one? This is the first one. Okay. So, so for dental appliances, um, the current guideline um, using the dental appliances is also called a mandibular advancement device. So what it basically does is that it advances your lower jaw forward like this, right? So it's opening the airway retropharyngeally at the back side of your throat. So if you have a restricted airway right over here, it would definitely help as long as your sleep apnea is only mild to moderate degree. Now, a lot of literature has also indicated that not only is opening up the airway on the back by advancing the jaw, it's also creating more tension in the muscle here, so it, it reduces the risk of collapsing while you're sleeping. Uh, so, so those patients would also benefit from using the, uh, the oral appliances. The problem is that a lot of us, when they have obstructed sleep apnea, the obstruction is actually at multiple different level. Some of the obstruction can be above the, 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 the retropharyngeal airway here, it would be up here. So the oral appliances might not help for those patients, or if they have what's called a central sleep apnea. The difference between obstructed sleep apnea versus central sleep apnea. So the obstructive sleep apnea, as the name implied, is some sort of obstruction of the airway. Central sleep apnea is, is the disease where you do not have a sufficient respiratory drive, like you, your breathing center in your brainstem is not generating that signal for you to breathe. So you have lack of central signal, therefore you do not breathe. So those patients will not benefit from the oral appliances. Thank you. Second question is with regards to the millions of prescriptions that are written for sleeping pills in Canada, and now the new evidence that those are related to actually a mortality. Um, <clears throat> can you comment on, I mean, these are people who use them long term. Can you comment on that? So you're asking to comment on why do we prescribe sleeping medication? So a link between increased mortality rates and sleep medication. Yeah, so, so most of the mortality rate is related to fall. So if you look at some of the study mostly done at the hospital, that those patients, some of the elderly people, when they're in the hospital, they have a hard time falling asleep they were given sleeping medication to help them to get a better night's sleep. But some of those patients need to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or even sometimes at home. So when someone's taking sedatives, uh, sleeping aid, they tend to at a higher risk of falling, therefore risk of brain injury, 
you know, trauma, hip fracture, hematoma, that type of thing. That's where the mortality comes from. A lot of the hospitals are moving away from giving sedatives uh, uh, to treat patients with insomnia, and they are moving towards using more natural way. Um, melatonin has been studied quite extensively in that regard. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, the prescribed medication is still more effective in terms of inducing sleep compared to some of the natural way, and they are fast. They are what we call a fast food medicine. You give someone a sleeping pill, if, you, if the dose is big enough, they will fall asleep. But with the natural substance, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not work. Um, so I guess in medicine, it's, 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 a, it's an art of medicine. We, we balance the risk versus the benefit. And I prescribe sleeping medication to my patient from time to time. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Richardson does that as well. But, but we do assess the risk versus the benefit. If someone who is chronic insomnia, they're only sleeping two, three hours a day, and they are, they are, they are horrible, and they just, they're just suffering, I'd rather give them medication to help them to sleep than not, not, not prescribing it, and they just don't get a good night's sleep. Thank you for the question. Uh, the fellow in the red shirt. Oh, we've, oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, sorry. Um, part of the data for the mortality related to people who are having narcotics as well as sleep sedatives like benzodiazepines, diazepam, tamazepam, e even zopiclone. And it's all because of the central depression of the brain that the narcotics help to stop you breathing and the sleep sedatives help to stop you breathing. And obviously, if taken in overdose, then they're incredibly dangerous together. So a lot of the mortality data and accidents, road traffic accidents, are from people who are on the both. So that's some of the mortality data is related to combination therapy. I guess if I can just add more to just, I guess, medications in general, one of the biggest challenges in geriatric care is to consolidate medication. I think a bit of the reality of our healthcare system is that um, medications prescribed for each condition, but very often what we don't have is a quarterback or a geriatrician or whoever is who's reviewing consistently the medication list to ensure that is the minimal set. <laughs> um, and that's really a big driver right now in geriatric care in terms of falls prevention, dementia care, et cetera. Um, we know the more medication someone takes, the greater the mortality and morbidity. So I guess just above and beyond sleep medications itself, um, combination of com uh, medications, et cetera, typically should always be reviewed and ensure that it's always properly dosed and that you really are taking the minimal set. Um, and that's really has to go back to your physician or whoever has a, the best perspective of your overall um, conditions and the health uh, conditions. Thank you. Uh, sir, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, in your introduction, you talked about three causes of uh, three main causes of sleep uh, problems. So one of them uh, being sleep apnea, but the the other one you refer, uh, refer to, and I don't remember what the term you used, but uh, most most of us would know it more as restless leg syndrome. Uh, could you go into a bit more detail about it, like uh, what triggers it and what uh, can be done to alleviate the symptoms? Yeah, so, um, so those are the three conditions that I see in the clinic most commonly. Uh, one being sleep apnea. Uh, second one is the limb movement disorder. So the full name of that is called sleep-related limb movement disorder. So it, it's a condition during which while you're asleep, your limb, and initially it's, it's thought to be only involving lower extremity, but now we also know that it can involve upper extremity, very much like a restless leg syndrome. Uh, so restless leg syndrome is not just restricted to leg. People can have the similar symptom involving arm as well, but the term restless leg syndrome started because the condition was described in someone who had trouble with the leg, but subsequently we do find people who have issue with the arm as well. So I'm not sure how many people know what restless leg syndrome is or have suffered from it. Yeah, so I, I, I suffered that myself as well. Sometimes if I take Benadryl, it's a sensation is so odd that it's not pain, it's just something very odd sensation. You have to move your limb to make it comfortable. 
And sometimes you have to be constantly moving to make it comfortable. And in most cases, it's while you are resting or before you go to bed. So in the cases of the limb movement disorder during sleep, the similar condition can happen while you are asleep as well. Your leg can start jerking quite frequently. And I have seen someone who had leg jerks for like five, 600 times throughout the night. And, and, this, and you talk to the spouse, they, they, they would say that, yeah, he kicked me all night long. Or he wake up, you know, head on the other side of the bed, the bed sheet is pretty mixed up. So those type of patients, if they are not associated with any sleep fragmentation, we don't tend to treat them. The, the problem arises when, when they have a limb movement and then have the cortical arousal, what is micro arousal, then you start getting sleep fragmentation. And that's what causes some of the increased risk factor for, uh, for uh, stroke and, uh, and, uh, and heart attack. And one of the, one, one of the, the big study was actually done in John Hopkins. They look at some of the studies and look at the, the risk of, for, um, uh, for heart attack. And they found that people who had five arousal an hour due to those leg movement, um, they have two times increased risk for heart attack um, in five to 10 years time. So, and, and he also asked about how you can uh, alleviate the symptoms. Yeah, so, so this is the primary and the sec secondary type of limb problem. Uh, primary just, it just means that we don't really know the causes of it. Um, the secondary type can be due to iron deficiency. Um, so young female who's menstruating quite heavily regularly, they may have iron deficiency and they can present in with that. The treatment is to supplement, supplement them with iron, iron supplement or somehow to reduce their they're, they're bleeding on a monthly day, uh, uh, basis. So the, that would be the secondary. Renal patient, people with kidney disease, uh, tend to have higher risk of developing this type of problem as well. Um, in terms of the primary one, we don't really know the causes of it, but we believe it's due to a lack of specific hormone called dopamine. So, so, so therefore, by, we treat patients by giving them those supplements, um, and t people tend to get better. Great, thank you very much. Uh, where is our next question? There you are. Good evening. Can you please comment on natural sleep remedies, especially Dr. Richards and Dr. Lai? Um, magnesium, uh, melatonin, tryptophan. And do you recommend that uh, people see their family physician or specialist? Um, in other words, are there things we need to be cautious of uh, in the amount that we take of some of these supplements, or should we just go to the health food store and start there? I'm especially interested in any relationship to migraine headaches or cardiac uh, side effects from taking natural supplements. Uh, Dr. Richardson, you're shaking your head, but I think you have something well, to say. Well, I was meaning that I, <laughs> I'm not aware that any of the natural supplements can cause issues. There was something like warfarin therapy, so many things interfere with You have to be careful with that, but I'm not aware of any other weird you can do. Melatonin works very nicely for some people. Um, it's used in, in children quite a lot by the pediatricians. Um, I actually tried it and it gave me nightmares. Um, so some people, luckily not very many, get, get nightmares from melatonin, but it seems to be perfectly safe. The main thing you have to do is always take it at the same time or close to the same time every evening because I've seen it used as a sleeping pill. So if they can't sleep, they take it. And then the next night they wake at two in the morning and they take a melatonin. And the next night they take it at 10 o'clock in the evening. And what the melatonin is trying to do is to tell your brain with the circadian rhythm, now is the time to go to sleep. So if you take it at different times, you're resetting your body clock the whole time. And that's why it doesn't work very well. But it seems to be very good. I mean, what the other things, I, I don't know about valerian and chamomile tea and, and whatever, but they certainly wouldn't cause problems that I'm aware of. Can, can I ask a quick follow-up question? Because a lot of people probably use over-the-counter things occasionally mm. if they want night all, gravel. Mm. I mean, I, I'm an expert on this stuff. I gobble it like candy, probably not good for me. Uh, can you just talk, can one of you talk about uh, over-the-counter regular kind of cold medicines or gravel or things you can 
take, so that some people take to go to sleep and what the implications are for long-term use of that? Selfishly, um, he asks. They certainly can be helpful. Um, and again, I, I get weird dreams anyway. Gravel give, gives me nightmares well, because I have tried it. Sorry. Um, yes, so gravel does make some people sleepy, but it gives me nightmares, so I don't take it. Um, they're supposed to be for occasional use only, but it does seem that if people use them on a regular basis, it doesn't seem to cause too So I use a lot of magnesium in treating patients with, with um, all kind of neurological and sleep disorder. Um, I, and I, I have pretty good success with magnesium. So if you look at the Health Canada, the guideline of magnesium is up to about 600 milligrams a day or a night. Uh, it will be pretty safe. Um, the only problem is that um, I usually tell my patient that if you start having diarrhea or loose stool, you are taking way too much magnesium. So I normally have patients starting at 150 milligrams of magnesium and then slowly go up to about 600 milligrams. Having said that, I do have a patient who's on 1,200 milligrams of magnesium and we're doing fine. Or some people are just happy to have a diarrhea because they have a constipation all the time, right? <laughs> so they take magnesium, they're happily taking 1,200 milligrams of magnesium every single day. So it's very effective. Um, the only thing I want to say is that magnesium normally comes with the calcium. So when you go to drugstore, it's usually magnesium, calcium. So calcium actually counteract the effect of magnesium. So physiologically, magnesium reduces, reduces, reduces the, the nerve firing. The calcium actually augment the nerve firing. So, so someone who's taking magnesium for, for neurological condition or taking for insomnia, I usually ask them to look for magnesium that is combined with something else but not the calcium. You can get magnesium citrate or magnesium gluconate. Some have better absorption than the other, and they even come in liquid magnesium as well. Uh, but again, you know, when you're taking too much, you get having diarrhea, that's a sign that you should, be, you should not be taking too much. But as long as you're taking less than 600 a day, generally it's pretty safe. Um, I, I use a lot of melatonin uh, for patients as well. Um, melatonin is a very, very short half Life, it's got half an hour. Um, so you really, really have to watch timing of your melatonin. It's a good inducing agent for insomnia, but it's not a good sustaining agent. Although if you go to, your, to the supermarket, you will see extended release melatonin, right? So it's not, it's not the melatonin itself released slowly, it's their formulations. So the melatonin itself still had about half, uh, half an hour of half light. 30 minutes of half light, but they formulate in a way that it's slowly released. So it, it released over time. So it gives you that sort of extended period of melatonin effect. So if I were to adjust someone else's circadian rhythm, then I would use the melatonin a lot earlier. Um, I would usually do it at least five hours before their target sleep schedule to adjust their circadian rhythm. So there are different way of using melatonin. And, and a lot of the patients are taking the 10 milligram melatonin, um, thinking that the higher the dose, the better. Um, actually are not, um, you know, theoretically you'll need about 0.5 milligram melatonin to saturate other receptors. Um, so I usually tell my patients three milligram is normally sufficient, but there are patients who swear that do you sleep better with 10 milligram? If, if that's the case, that's okay. I mean, you can take 10 milligram, it's not gonna do anything harm, but theoretically, you don't need a very large of melatonin. Three milligram would be sufficient. Uh, as far as other um, natural substance, I mean, there are literature out there supporting it, the val valerium, the chamomile, the, the 5-HTP, the tryptophan. I, I don't use it very frequently. B6 can be used quite frequently, but the other one, it's, it's listed as one of the calming agent, um, but I, I don't use it very frequently in my clinic. Yeah, Dr. Richardson. Um, just a thought about magnesium. It's also extremely good for leg cramps at Charlie Horses. So they wake a lot of people up at night. And if you take magnesium before you go to bed, it lessens your chance of getting them. So a lot of people use it for that, and it's very effective. Our next question, uh, just here on the left. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, we, you've talked a lot about the optimum uh, amount of sleep between being between six and eight hours. Um, is that specifically as a single unit of sleep, or can someone sleep five hours at night and two hours in the afternoon? Is that as effective? And conversely, <clears throat> if you're sleeping eight hours or nine hours at night and then two hours in the afternoon, meaning you're getting over 10 hours of sleep, is that also posing a risk? And if you don't mind, I do have a second question, and that is there's a lot of talk right now about the benefits of medical marijuana for sleep. Is there any research whatsoever into that topic? I can, well, maybe I answer your second question first. I, a second question first, which is I don't know. So I don't know if anyone else wanted to take that on. I'm just going to come up. So I actually did a research before I come here. <laughs> I, I do see a lot of patients who, who come in and, and, and they are, they are they're chronic insomniac um, and they, they claim that they have seen everybody, they have tried everything and marijuana is the only thing that works for them. Um, I, I'm not disputing that. Um, I, I think to answer your question, I think objectively there isn't much um, research on marijuana and use that agent to treat insomnia. More, more of the research is on treating pain conditions. Um, so, 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 so that's sort of my answer to your questions. Yeah, so the first one, so I guess um, in terms of when we say six to eight, we're really talking about the sleep duration during that night time, not so much broken up as an example that you provided four hours at night and two hours during the day. I guess that kind of brings up to the issue of napping. So there's been a lot of research looking at it, are nap, is napping helpful or not? Um, so there are some suggestion that napping in the afternoon, approximately 30 minutes is good. Um, but I think when you're starting to talk about consistent napping that's for longer durations, combined with shorter durations of sleep at nighttime, that's actually starting to look at the patterns we typically see in older adults where they have a hard time sleeping for longer durations during the nighttime and then you get this daytime sleepiness with chronic napping um, and certainly in older adults who are institutionalized and typically have cognitive impairment and dementia, those are the patterns we see where day and night is flipped. Um, there's also could probably more you know, behavioral issues as well. So. I would say that pattern is typically not what we would uh, strive for um, and typically is a, is a concerning pattern, I suppose, if it's on a chronic basis. Again, again, we're talking about chronic patterns, not you know, a day where you're jet lagged, you can't fall asleep for saying so you go for four hours, the next day you recover and you sleep for another four hours during the day. We're talking about chronic behaviors or patterns. Dr. Lai, go ahead. Uh, just one quick comment. So. <clears throat> You know that epidemiology study looking at what, what are the optimal sleep time, we need to remember that it's a study of a, a lot of patients. So it's a population study. Um, not, like anything in medicine, we, we need to draw guidelines uh, because the study, if you look at the, the curve, it's actually a bell curve. So in the middle is between six to nine or six to, uh, six to eight or six to nine hours. They tend to have longer longevity and the slave sort of sleeping less or sleeping more, the longevity tend to start, start uh, climbing down. But, but I, I do take in the patient individually too. Um, you know, some people who sleep 10 hours and they are, they are, they are feeling great, they, they are rested, they, they wake up feeling wonderful. Um, they, they may be one of those long sleepers. Uh, vice versa, people who, they're, they're people who sleep only five hours a day and they are energized, they're feeling great, they, they, they are doing well with their work. They may be one of those short sleepers. Uh, so there's always, uh, always that exceptions to any kind of conclusions. Um, so if you are a short sleeper, long sleeper, if you're feeling great, if you, have, if you get screened, you, you don't have any other sleep disorder, you know, you don't have to be panicking. That's, that's, that's what it is. Uh, Dr. Richardson, before we go to our last question. It's just I always, when I, I look at data like that or hear about it, I always wonder if it's just raw data, there are lots of different explanations for it. So the very short sleepers, I mean, in England, Margaret Thatcher was famous. I think she only slept like four hours a night, but was amazingly productive. Having said that, she did get a stroke in later life. 
but she really was just a dynamo and hardly slept. The other thing is that if people are sleeping a long time, why are they sleeping a long time? Are they sick? Because sick people sleep a long time. Um, do they have sleep apnea, so they're constantly tired, so they sleep a long time? All of which would increase their mortality. So it might not... It's a, I'm more interested in why they're sleeping a long time as opposed to they're fit and healthy and they sleep longer than you think. You know, so raw, raw data you have to be cautious about. I think we have time for one more question at the back. Hi, and this is for, for you. This, I had sleep deprivation because my daughter kept on waking me up uh, when she was um, from newborn till she was five years old. So for five years I never slept. So the doctor said that I had to take medication, all this stuff. Then I decided to ask my daughter not to wake me up. <laughs> so she woke me up one night and I said, why do you keep on waking me up? And she says, well, you told me to tell you when I had to go to the bathroom. And I said, you're old enough now, you can just go to the bathroom on your own. And that was the end of my sleep deprivation. <laughs> so maybe you should talk to your child and get them not to wake you up in the middle of the night. Well, thankfully, he's outgrown it, and we're, all, we're, we're, getting, we're getting lots of sleep at my house now. <laughs> Thank you very much. We probably have time for one more quick one. Uh, there we go. We want to give our guests a, a chance to sort of sum up their thoughts here at the end. Hi. You, someone had mentioned a group in Kelowna, I believe it is, um, Community Something Sleep, a group in perhaps for people who need some ongoing assistance with uh... the, the company is called um, Community Sleep Coach. So if you Google that name, it should come up. They have a very well-designed website. And the owner is Alina Kruzak. She used to be a sleep technologist, uh, worked out of the hospital, uh, but she had ventured into her own company. And she is a certified um, clinical sleep educator. Uh, so she deal with um, patients who has chronic insomnia and she work with companies, physicians and patients to help them um, to obtain a better night's sleep. Before we wrap up, uh, we'd like to give everybody a chance to sort of sum up their thoughts and we'll go in reverse order. So Dr. Richardson, if you'd like to dab. It doesn't have to be long, uh, but go ahead. Okay. Um my main take-home message is if you have been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, please use your machine. Because I know what the lack of oxygen did. It gave me a stinking headache, the lack of sleep, or the disturbed sleep, the fragmented sleep, upset my brain and stopped me remembering new things. And if it did it to me, then it's doing it to other people. And... They've also got, yes, they annoy their wife because they snore, or they annoy the husband because they snore, and they feel tired in the day, they're more likely to crash their car, there are various other things. It really is worth doing. I have a patient who has terrible sleep apnea, who doesn't bother using his machine and keeps finding excuses like there's no room to put a table by the side of his bed, and he comes to my waiting room and falls asleep in it and he even falls asleep in consultations. Now, he denies it utterly, but he complains of memory problems and not feeling well and all this, and yet I keep telling him it's really a good idea to use your machine, and he still doesn't. Um, so, it really, my take-home message is, if you have been diagnosed, it is for your own good to use it. We're not just saying it. Dr. Foster. Thank you. I think I think you stole my uh, my conclusion, but uh, uh, I certainly would echo that you know right now that it, uh, CPAP is the best treatment that we have. Uh, hopefully, in a few years, I can come back here and tell you that I've I've, I've found a way to protect you all from cardiovascular disease. Um, but that said, there, there, we're still there's still always going to be a role for uh, for CPAP in terms of uh, protecting against the sleep fragmentation, uh, at least for now. So uh, so good luck to you all. And Dr. Lou Ambrose. 
Um, I, I guess the fact that, uh, yes, uh, changes in your sleep pattern might be common with aging, but I don't think it has to be accepted. Um, I think the evidence does show that, you know, there's things that you can do to modify it. And I guess to reiterate what um, the other panelist says, it, when we talk about these recommendations, you know, again, if, you f if, it, if it's not a change for you and you're feeling fine, then that's great. I'm re anytime I've been referring to sort of these optimal windows or patterns that we're concerned about, we're talking about changes that has occurred within an individual that's associated with, you know, um, like with concerns. Um, but that said, like I, I, going back to the main point is that, you know, changes in sleep pattern is commonly observed in aging, but it's not, it shouldn't be accepted as a fact of aging. Like many things that we now learn about aging, there's lots of things you can do to promote the best outcomes as you, um, you know, into your later lives. And Dr. Lai. I'd like to conclude saying that uh, do not become a trained engineer or astronaut. <laughs> And, and when in doubt, use pink mask. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all our panelists. And before we conclude, I'd like to just thank uh, Dr. Joan Batorf and UBC for inviting me back here. And we should uh, s give a thank you to Dimitri, who's operating our, our microphones and our speakers. Thank you. And remember, if you do solve your sleep problems and you're early to bed and early to rise, you can always listen to CBC. <laughs> have a good evening and have a good sleep.